Welcome back to Chris's Dark Matter Club. We're here for part two of the most important evidence we have for the existence of dark matter. The invisible substance that makes up a quarter of the energy budget of the universe. If you missed part one of this video, there's a link in the description so you can go and see where we talked about what dark matter is and the first pieces of evidence for its existence. Galaxy rotation curves, galaxy clusters, and gravitational lensing. Let's not waste any time now and jump right back into why we think particle dark matter really exists, even if we have no idea what it is. Dark matter evidence number three, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB, is the remnants of the first light emitted in the universe's history, and its temperature is almost perfectly uniform across the sky. It does, however, have small deviations, and these deviations are incredibly important and contain a lot of information. On this CMB sky map, the red areas are patches of light where the temperature had a slightly higher value than the average, and the blue spots have a temperature slightly lower than average. That average is about 3 Kelvin, and the deviations here are absolutely tiny. These fluctuations in the CMB temperature are sensitive to the existence, amount, and distribution of both normal matter and dark matter, but in different ways, and mapping the size and frequency of the fluctuations tells us that dark matter must exist. Otherwise, the CMB map would look very different. Rather than looking at this colourful map all the time, which hurts your eyes after a while, and you start seeing writing and images in the blobs, cosmologists prefer to plot something called the power spectrum of the temperature fluctuations. This basically tells us how many spots of a certain size we see in the cosmic microwave background. You might notice that there seems to be a lot of spots with a similar size here, and we see the same thing when we plot the power spectrum, which I'm showing you here. The horizontal axis is the size of the spots on the sky, and the vertical axis tells us how many spots of that size we see. You can think of it like a probability distribution. If you give me a random size, the higher the curve is at that point, the more likely you are to be able to find spots of that size in the CMB. This big peak here corresponds to that size that we seem to see a lot of, like this spot for example. And then as we go to bigger sizes, we see more peaks at a few different places, which you can't really see by eye on the CMB map. It's these peaks that tell us about dark matter. We can basically predict what the power spectrum would look like for different amounts of dark matter in the universe. And the one that matches the observed power spectrum is the one where dark matter makes up about 25% of the universe. If there was no or very little dark matter, then the peaks would get smaller as we go from left to right, which isn't what we see in reality. For example, the second and third peaks from the data are basically the same size. As the amount of dark matter increases, every other peak gets suppressed until we get to something that looks like what we actually see. And that value for the amount of dark matter is about a quarter of all of the energy in the universe. This animation shows this really nicely. And if you've seen anyone talk about dark matter before, then you've probably seen this great animation by Wayne Hu. We all use it because it's so good that no one ever bothers to make their own, and we all just use Wayne's. As the pink bar goes up, it corresponds to more dark matter in the universe. And you can see how the power spectrum would change as a result, until we get to the one that actually looks right. The next piece of evidence comes from simulating the evolution of the universe. This means using a computer, inputting the laws of physics and the amount of radiation and the other stuff in the universe near the beginning, and then simulating how things would evolve so that we can compare this to what we actually see. If we do this process with no dark matter in the simulation, we don't get nearly enough structure on large scales, so not enough galaxies, clusters, and so on. This means that there isn't enough gravity forcing all of the matter to collapse into structure. So it all remains more spread out than it is in reality. However, if we add in the amount of dark matter suggested by the other probes we've talked about, so about five times more than visible matter, and run the simulation again, we end up with a simulated universe that looks very similar to our own real one. This is because before recombination, which causes the release of the CMB, the ordinary matter, which is called baryons, was coupled to photons meaning they were linked together and basically forced to behave in the same ways. So when the photons streamed through the early universe, the baryons did so too, all the way up to recombination. And this stops any gravitational collapse and stops structure forming before recombination. However, the dark matter doesn't interact with the electromagnetic force, and so it's not coupled to radiation or photons, meaning it can collapse and begin to form some structures earlier in the universe's history. This provides gravitational wells that baryons can later fall into after recombination and form the structure we see today. This also provides evidence that dark matter is cold, i.e. massive and can't move near the speed of light. 
rather than hot. If dark matter was hot, it would travel at relativistic speeds, and it would stream in the same way that photons did and stop any structure forming. Hence, non-relativistic cold dark matter has become the accepted paradigm. Finally, and one of my personal favorites because it's a little controversial, there's evidence from a cluster of galaxies called the Bullet Cluster. Well, there's actually a few galaxy clusters that show the same thing, but this is the famous one. The controversy here is that depending on who you ask, the Bullet Cluster is either evidence for dark matter or evidence against dark matter. Exciting, right? Let's look at a picture of the Bullet Cluster and I'll explain why. This is a composite image using data from a few different telescopes to tell an interesting story. The Bullet Cluster is a pair of galaxy clusters, here and here, that have collided head on and passed through each other. Kind of like a bullet, I guess. The visible light that makes up all the orange and white galaxies all over the image is from the Magellan and Hubble Space Telescope. The pink areas show the distribution of hot gas, which makes up most of the normal matter in the cluster. And this is taken from data from an X-ray telescope called Chandra. The blue areas show the center of mass of the two colliding galaxies. And this is found from the way it gravitationally lenses the objects behind the merger. The interesting thing is that the centers of mass is completely separated from the centers of the visible matter, suggesting that there's a separation between the two. The usual story goes that this shows the existence of dark matter, which doesn't interact except via gravity. So while normal matter feels friction in the collision and slows down and ends up close to the center of the image, the dark matter doesn't feel that and only slows down due to gravity. This means that the dark matter ends up further out and perfectly explains the image, which we can now say shows normal matter in pink and dark matter in blue. That is, unless you're a particle dark matter denier. These people point out that the bullet cluster merger is happening at speeds that are too high to be statistically likely. From the X-ray observations, we know that the galaxies in the cluster are traveling at around 3000 kilometers per second and computer simulations with particle dark matter tell us that collisions at such high speeds are incredibly unlikely. Estimates for the rarity of the bullet cluster range from one in a few million all the way up to one in around 10 billion. If instead, we say that there's no particle dark matter, but rather we modify the equations that describe gravity, which is to say we make changes to Einstein's general relativity, then these high speeds in the bullet cluster merger are actually pretty easy to explain. You might think it's still weird that the center of the gravitational pull isn't at the center of the visible matter, but this is okay in modified gravity, since these theories introduce extra forces and particles, and there's no reason why the gravitational pull has to go to the center of the normal matter. This means that while the bullet cluster is often used as evidence for dark matter, it also provides some problems for particle dark matter too, which is why I find this one so interesting. However, this is all I can say about evidence against dark matter, because like all cosmologists, I did sign a non-disclosure agreement with Big Cosmo to not talk about evidence against dark matter. Duh. Dark matter exists, and that's the story we've all agreed to tell. However, once my NDA runs out, check back for more videos that will discuss alternatives to particle dark matter. But for now, I've already said too much. Just to keep the big Cosmo big wigs happy, I'll end with one more piece of evidence for particle dark matter, which is that a few small galaxies have been observed which seem to contain no dark matter. And this wouldn't be possible if dark matter came from modifications to gravity. Until next time, stay safe team. Keep up the fight against Big Cosmo. I'll see you soon, if they don't get me first. Bye!